And so I think the challenge is to figure out how is it that universities are in service, not just to their students and their faculty and getting publications and getting tenure and all that, but how are they helping neighborhood level issues for, for residents? And growing up um, here and growing up in Dorchester, I did experience that sort of that, that, that suspicion that you have in the neighborhood because your neighborhood has been studied to death, has been mapped, has been quoted, but there's no benefit to you in the neighborhood. And because we have so many universities and so many, no offense, students who have term papers, who have independent studies, it's like, you know, and I, I have these students too, we unleash them to 700,000 residents as a field site. And that, that is not it. All right, well, I'm going to get us started right on time. Uh, what I have to say is not particularly interesting, so if a few people miss it coming in, that's not a problem. I'm Garrett Nelson. I'm the president and head curator here at the Leventhal Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library. For those of you who haven't visited before, the Leventhal Center is an independent nonprofit in a long-term relationship with the Boston Public Library. We care for the library's cartographic collections, but perhaps more importantly, we run education, research, and public engagement programs around topics that connect people to places in the past, present, and future, as seen through the lens of maps and geography. Tonight we have a really amazing meeting of the minds, uh, three uh, kind of brilliant scholars, activists, engaged researchers from very different perspectives, but who share a common interest in questions of environmental injustice and, just, and justice. Uh, sitting to my farthest right is Dr. Tracy Corley, who is the Director of Research and Partnerships at the Conservation Law Foundation, where she works on projects bringing people together to tackle the complex issues that drive climate action and environmental justice. With communities across New England, she co-facilitates action research that aims to transform policies and practices to advance environmental justice. She led the authorship of the report From Transactional to Transformative, The Case for Equity in Gateway City, Transit Oriented Development. And with GBH, she co-produced a companion webinar series on equitable development. Dr. Corley lectures part-time at Northeastern. She's a grist fixer and is a Biden administration appointee to the Social and Community Sciences Subcommittee of the EPA's Board of Scientific Counselors. Please welcome Dr. Tracy Corley. Sitting in the middle of our group is Dr. Carolyn Crockett. She is the author of People Before Highways, Boston Activists, Urban Planners, and a New Movement for City Making, uh, basically the inspiration for an entire case and a half of our exhibition. And she's also the co-founder of Multicultural Youth Tour of What's Now, or My Town, an award-winning Boston-based educational nonprofit. Carolyn holds a PhD from the American Studies Program at Yale University. She's a fellow geographer with a Master of Science in Geography from the London School of Economics. And she also holds a Master of Arts in Religion from Yale Divinity School. She currently holds a faculty appointment as Professor of Urban History, Public Policy, and Planning at MIT's Department of Urban Studies and Planning. And she currently leads the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce in a partnership with the Federal Reserve Bank to revisit the 2015 Color of Wealth Report on Closing the Racial Wealth Gap. Previously, she served as the first Chief Equity Officer, Director of Economic Policy and Research, and Director of Small Business Development for the City of Boston. Professor Carolyn Crockett. <laughs> and finally, the person who actually came with the idea for today's event uh, last summer, Professor Chad Montry, who's from the UMass Lowell History Department. He teaches courses on American environmental history, food in American history, radicalism in American history, Malcolm X, historical methods, and other topics. He's the author of five books, including Whiteness in Plain View, A History of Racial Exclusion in Minnesota, The Myth of Silent Spring, Rethinking the Origins of American Environmentalism, and To Save the Land and People, A History of Opposition to Surface Coal Mining in Appalachia. Most recently, he was selected as, for a Fulbright Canada Research Chair at the University of Calgary. Professor Chad Montry. So the format of tonight's discussion, I'm going to kick it off with a question, which I've asked all three of our panelists to respond to. We're going to follow that up with a, another subsequent discussion with the group. And then we really imagine tonight as a chance for you all to ask questions of this group, to foster a very open and, and multi-directional conversation around these complicated, century-spanning topics. <laughs> 
I wanted to begin with a question about the environment. It's one that's posed in our exhibition. It's one that I know many of you in Professor Landsmark's class have thought about. And that's this. Many of us still think of the environment as something that's out there, not about humans. It's about trees, it's about water, it's about the atmosphere, and so on. But in each of our three presenters' work today, we find that the distinction between social challenges and environmental challenges is blurry, or maybe that it's not a distinction at all. I'd love if you can each give one example from your work of a historical story or a line of research that the casual observer might not initially think is an environmental question at all. And then tell us why do you think that story really should be central to public discussion of environmentalism? We'll start with Chad, Carolyn, and Tracy. Thanks, thanks everybody for coming out and all the organizers involved in this was um, a complicated process, and so what you see here um, really involved a collective effort. Um, I think many people here are probably familiar with the increased concern that people had about DDT and other pesticides spraying um, in white middle class suburbs that was occurring in the 1950s, which is the initial prompt for Rachel Carson to start doing some research that led her to publish the book Silent Spring in 1962, which many people refer to as the thing that starts the environmental movement, right? Um, and in fact, that was a serious problem that was, that was um, you know, becoming uh, clear, and she made it more uh, evident, and certainly it deserved the expose that it, that it got. Um, but there's, there's a very important thing that's missing in Rachel Carson's book. Um, the title of my book is The Myth of Silent Spring, and I don't mean by that that the book itself is a myth. It's, it's pretty good science. It's fairly sound. It's stood up over time. But the idea that the book started the environmental movement is not correct, and that's the mythology, and that's not anything she ever claimed. In fact, it's something that other people put on that. But there are ways in which the book fell short, and that uh, certainly is the case in terms of her own awareness of race and ethnicity and class, and the way that those things determine people's exposure to environmental hazards, also who's responsible for the environmental hazards, and also what people could do about the environmental hazards that they faced. Um, there are a couple of exceptions in the book, but for the most part, for instance, she never talks about farm workers. She doesn't talk about the Mexican and Filipino uh, migrant uh, field hands that are probably getting exposed to pesticide on a more regular basis than anyone else in the country, right? So it's kind of uh, a major oversight in, in the book. That's one example, but I think another example that I'll try to sort of um, focus on, and then and I'll do this as quickly as I can so we can work through um, this question, um, is the campaigns that people were organizing in the 1960s and 70s, or beginning in the 1960s and 70s against lead poisoning. Um, which few, I mean, I'm, some people do recognize this, right? So I, I, I think I can't say that nobody knows this or nobody claims this, but most white environmentalists, most white environmental historians do not include the fight against lead poisoning as part of the narrative that they tell in terms of the origins of, of the American environmental movement and the evolution of the movement over the course of the 20th century. Um, and I think this is interesting if you think about the DDT story, right? Because the, really the only difference in, in the respect between you know, the exposure people are having to DDT and the worries they have, especially in terms of their children's exposure, and the story about lead poisoning and the, the worries people have about lead poisoning ex uh, exposure is, is, is race and class and place. Um, and one example of this is in, in the 1960s on the north side of St. Louis, um, there are many activists who are coming out of the black civil rights movement as well as anti-poverty activism that's associated with the Great Society in the 1960s who began to turn a lot of attention toward um, the lead paint that was producing dust that was getting in people's blood, and including kids. Um, and this is a thing that's happening more in the 1950s after World War II because there had been an increased use of lead paint during the interwar period, but also because there's a lot of white flight from St. Louis, right? And white people are leaving St. Louis in huge numbers to go live in suburbs that they close off to other people, and what they leave behind is disinvestment. What they leave behind is dilapidated tenements and, and um, apartments that the people that are living in them don't own, right? And so there's a, there's a new uh, intensity to the problem. These activists, who don't necessarily call themselves environmentalists, are doing the work of environmentalism when they 
they are the ones who start getting the thousands of tests for kids in terms of their blood to see and monitor what kind of lead exposure they have, when they start pressuring the city to pass the first um, legislation to protect uh, people who are living in apartments with lead, um, with lead paint. Um, this is a legislation that they get in 1970. It's not very effective because of the way it's enforced. There's some, there's some limitations to it. And so these activists form a thing called the People's Coalition Against Lead Poisoning. And in August of 1970, they take a you know, page from the civil rights movement and they start doing sit-ins at realty offices and telling landlords they're not leaving until the landlords start taking care of the properties. And when that doesn't happen, they also start doing rent strikes. So is this an environmental campaign? Yes. Is it a civil rights campaign? Yes. Is it a housing campaign? Yes, it is all of those things, and we need to put it into the narrative for how we think about where the environmental movement came from in order to understand what we should be doing, I think, in the 21st century. That's partly why it's important. Thank you, Chad. Um, it's a mic drop moment, but I'll try to add. Um, so I'm Carolyn. I'm so happy to be here. I really want to thank Garrett and the team. and. It wasn't until I walked in this room that I actually realized that the last time I was in this room, is the Commonwealth Room? Yeah, it's the name, Salon. I was giving my first book talk <laughs> four years ago in February, so I'm having a little bit of the feels um, because it's been a four-year journey that I have been on. And I brought this book because I figured I should look at it a little bit just to kind of fresh myself up, but I, <laughs> this is my book, People Before Highways, and I remember coming in this room and I was so nervous that first time talking about it because you just don't know. And um, it was a really um, special conversation, which I know happens here because my story is that I, I'm from Boston, I grew up here, I'm born and raised in Dorchester, and basically, um, like so many kids that grew up here, just didn't really know a lot about the city, uh, or overall. I knew about my neighborhood, I could tell you about my neighbors, my street, my block all day long. If you asked me about East Boston or even downtown, I would probably need a map. So um, my own story is just trying to make sense of this place that I have called home home um, that hasn't always claimed me, but I have claimed in different ways, and it's just funny to me how this very room has played such a prominent part of the story, so thank you for just assembling us here. Um, this question about environmental justice um, and environmental impacts and what is the environment is a really powerful question for us to, to sit with because it makes me think of the, the research I was doing to, um, to produce this book, which if many of you may not know this story, but basically um, we have this distinction uh, that we're so proud of in the fact that uh, Boston residents and neighbors and people all over the region came together to stop the expansion of I-95 um, from crushing through the middle of the city. So you all know that I-95 goes in a pretty much continuous strip from Maine to Florida. It's like 1,300 miles of asphalt. Uh, and so there are two places along that strip where there's a break. And uh, one of those places is, you guessed it, right here. So in the 1960s moment, people came together and basically said no, uh, said hell no to a highway. And so you have to do this weird thing that you all know you have to go to 128, you have to go outside of the city to go to 95 north or south, but it doesn't come all the way into downtown like it was intended to. So if you were driving in Baltimore or if you're driving in DC or all these big, big places, big city capitals, mostly along the eastern seaboard, you can get there by I-95, but not here. The other break on the eastern seaboard is in Maine, around Portland, but that's another story for another day, but it's facts. So uh, growing up here, I, I didn't really know this story. I didn't know uh, that people had come together, thousands of people, and stood up to the president, and stood up to the governor, and stood up to the mayor, and said no, no, no. Uh, but I did know that the city kind of had this orange line over here, and I had heard it was one, someplace else before, and I had heard about this thing called the Southwest Por Corridor Park, and it seemed nice, you could ride your bike, you could kind of plant gardens, you could do all these things, but I did not realize that those things were a memorial to a really successful urban social movement. And so as a part of researching the story, I talked to people, uh, and one of the people that I talked to was former state rep Gloria Fox. And Gloria Fox, uh, an incredible state rep, an incredible woman who talked about the fact that it was the highway fight 
in the 1960s in the clearance in front of her house. She was in Whittier Street projects, which is near Tremont Street. And clearance for the highway uh, began in 1966, and it seemed like it was a done deal, right? There was money from the feds, like 90 cents on the dollar reimbursement. So all these governors and mayors were saying, we want roads, we want roads because we want money. And so Gloria Fox uh, was tapped on the shoulder essentially by another activist giant, Chuck Turner, who had cut his teeth in the Northern Student Movement and SNCC and all these incredible, powerful civil rights organizations and started to organize people around stopping the highway. And he taps Gloria Fox on the shoulder because she said she realized that her son, who had been playing outside, was coming home and he was coughing, coughing, coughing. This kind of connects to some of the story you're telling, coughing. And she said she realized that he was coughing because the dust outside of their house that was created because this complete vacant swath of earth was exposed to, there were, there were businesses there, there were homes there that were cleared to make way for the highway. And Gloria Fox's son and his friends were jumping through these piles of soil and, and wheezing. And she said that it was at that exact moment that she realized that we were the environment. That's what she says. She thought about highway expansion. She thought about I-95 coming through uh, their front door, basically, coming through their lungs is how she talked about it. And she talked about it in terms of the impact, the human impact on her child. And that was a politicizing moment for her to become an anti-highway activist alongside of Chuck Turner and so many others to really take action. And so I think in that story, certainly for me, it recasts absolutely how we think of the environment as something out there, something inert that we're looking, as opposed to this ecosystem that we are a part of. Um, I might argue to say we're not necessarily the center of, but we need to understand what, what are the effects of these decisions that we're making. And as Mel King would famously ask us to consider, in whose interests are we creating these plans, these ideas, the, even the notion of progress? And so for me, it's been incredible to learn how the interstate highway system, a system of 50,000 or so uh, miles connecting every single state in the country, how this idea that was conceived of as visionary in the 1950s moment how that has brought so much devastation uh, to our country in the name of progress. And so when I think about the 1956 uh, Federal Highway Act, and I think about that on the back of the 1954 Brown decision, the decision to move toward racial integration, not only in schools, but in all of our accommodations, and what it would mean to have these two different bodies of law organizing, reorganizing, and disordering our environment in very different and diametrically opposed ways, it raises a question for us, not just in terms of what that meant in the middle of the 20th century, but what it means as we think about the long genealogy of changes and effects that we inherit now. And so for the Boston story, it was really 1969, 1969 uh, and the Environmental Policy Act which is significant because you don't necessarily think of that in the context of transportation planning. But what was significant there is that the way that it created a standard for measuring federally funded projects and the, the kind of environmental Im impact that they would have on communities. So standardizing planning processes, standardi standardizing notifications about uh, plans, standardizing the need to raise, uh, the raise standards of al alternative plans. And so the, the, the EPA decision of 1969 signed off by Richard Nixon, someone that we don't tend to love historically, uh, but absolutely is someone who uh, gives us so much teeth um, and so much of a backbone in terms of put, put it, moving forward with the environmental justice as we know it. And so specifically for the anti-highway act fight in Boston, it was the 1969 EPA sign off and what that meant for stopping the highways soon to be devastating impact, not only in Roxbury, Jamaica Plain, South End, and elsewhere, but also in the Foul Meadow, also to our north. And, and that gave us some real, real heft to what folks were, for, were fighting for. So I think in the end, 
this question of in whose interest is the question really making us examine not only the impact of what we're doing right now, but also trying to make us understand and think about that way into the future. As we sit here, we're 50 years after this anti-highway fight in Boston, but we're still fighting for so many of the, the same things that they had in, in mind then. Um, but I'm so appreciative for this conversation because I'm hoping that we're smarter we're more informed and more willing to be critical about how we understand equity and how we measure it. So I have the, uh, I have the unenviable task of going after both of those, <laughs> of two very just well-researched, well, just well-versed historians, and I am not a historian. So I'm just going to put that out there up front. But I do want to start. <laughs> so I do want to start, though, by saying, once again, thank you so much to Chad for actually sparking this idea, and also to the team at the Leventhal Map Center and uh, GBH, and also all, to all the sponsors of this event today. Because this is a topic that you know, we need to be having these conversations more, but we also should be talking a little bit more about you know, how to take action on these things. And so you know, as you've kind of heard the story of what's happened here in Boston, I'm going to talk a little bit more about kind of like the future and kind of like how this all kind of like, like talks about like what we do next. Um, but I do want to kind of back up a little bit uh, because one of the things I just want to just point out and recognize is that whenever we talk about the environmental movement, you talked about like in whose interests. And uh, you know, whenever we talk about like the research that we do at CLF, we talk about for whom, by whom, using what means and for what ends. And so as I think about the environmental movement, I've been kind of chewing on this, and I don't have all the historical data to kind of back this up. So please, hop in at any moment and kind of like, you know, let's talk about this a little bit more. But as someone who is from the Southeast, I grew up on a farm, and I have roots that are both African American as well as indigenous here in this country. And I think about, as we talk about environmental movement and environmental protection, I think about the longstanding indigenous principles of stewardship that have gone unrecognized until relatively recently. And then I also think about all of the enslaved peoples and how close they were to the land and they were really on the front lines of seeing what we were doing through our agricultural practices and then through our industrial practices to what was happening on the land. And as someone who was growing up in the 70s, on a, what used to be a working farm but was quickly declining because of the coal plant nearby that you know, was spewing pollution into the air that contributes to the asthma that I have today, and thinking about all of the mass development. The town that I was born in had 500 people when I was born, but by the time I graduated from high school, the region, because my family still lives in an unincorporated uh, part of the county, that entire region had 60,000 people. So we used to get our water from a well that we could no longer tap into because of overuse, but also because of a regulatory taking by the county to put a sewage line through our family's property. We still have over 100 acres left. And so they actually decided instead of putting it near the developments where they were all happening, to actually put it right through the middle of our family's property. And so I think about all of these things. I think about the regulatory takings. I think about industrialization. I think about the long history that people of color in this country have had with fighting on behalf of the environment but not having an organized movement around it and not having the language to talk about it. I think about how much of that has been overlooked until recently. And that makes me think about kind of like where we're going in the future. And so as we think about you know, what's happening here in Boston, I think about our research that we're doing right now around the Healthy Neighborhood Study. And our team, in partnership with a team of researchers at MIT, and also community um, uh, organizations in nine different communities here in Eastern Massachusetts, are working together to co-create, not an institution leading, but actually institutions are serving as facilitators of work out in community to help train people who are in the community to recognize and start to put language around things so that they have the tools to be able to say, these things that we've been experiencing for generations, we now have the language and we now have the techniques and methodologies to be able to track, monitor, and measure those things in order to substantiate things that the community, especially in the, you know, we're all researchers, we want evidence, we want data, we want facts. But community knowledge, their experiences, and their cultural knowledge has a lot to contribute to our understanding and the research that we conduct. And so being able to elevate that, the Healthy Neighborhood Study has been bridging that information gap. 
between community knowledge and mainstream institutional knowledge. And so they've been working in nine different communities. And as we think about something that we don't think about as being environmental, uh, we have looked at a number of different factors. Uh, for example, looking at issues related to um, communities and how uh, people in environmental justice communities here in eastern Massachusetts have being, are being pushed out of urban centers out onto the fringes. Um, a lot of the mainstream research was saying we're not finding you know, sufficient evidence that this is actually happening. We're not seeing it, it, gentrification is actually pushing people out of their communities. Well, it just so happens that a fellow at the Boston Federal Reserve Bank decided to reach out to our Healthy Neighborhood Study Team and actually ask, hey, you know, I'm looking at, uh, have access to this credit reporting data. What should I be looking at in order to be able to investigate this question of is gentrification actually pushing people out of communities? And so as the researcher was kind of going through and looking at all the different variables, it's like, well, let me bring in a couple of people who actually live in these communities to see what they had to say. So after kind of walking folks through like the data, and they were like, no, no, you're looking at the wrong variables. If you actually look at these, these are things that are actually impacting our daily lives. Run the analysis on that. And sure enough, was able to find that those particular uh, parameters which were showing that people with subprime credit scores were getting pushed further and further out of urbanized areas here in eastern Massachusetts. And as a result, they're getting pushed out into the fringe communities. And so that includes, uh, I mean, even people getting pushed out of our gateway cities, out into the suburbs, out into rural areas, which might not initially sound like a, an environmental issue. But when you think that that whole process is destroying social fabric, it is destroying their social networks and the resources that they have. It is destroying their access to the jobs that they already have. That means they're traveling further distances, which requires, right now, fossil fuel, um, uh, technologies. I mean, even our commuter rail system here in Massachusetts is still fueled by diesel. And so it's all spewing all of these toxins into the air, contributing to the poor air quality. We have, like, here in the state of Massachusetts, I think, according to not this recent report, I haven't looked at the rankings yet, but I, the American Lung Association's national report, we have three of the nation's asthma capitals, top ten asthma capitals here in Massachusetts because of our over-reliance on transportation sources that are causing pollution. And the more we push people away from their home communities, the more that we insist that people with subprime credit scores, people who don't have equitable access to housing markets, that they actually travel more in order to live lives that now people who are like enamored with 15-minute neighborhoods, which I've, I've worked on this research and works, and I, I love this concept, but the fact that we're actually creating this to actually bring people back to the city, who are you bringing back to the city? The cities are full of people. It's just that they're black and brown and have very limited wealth. So what they're doing is they're thinking about the white flight we talked about earlier, bringing those folks back into the city so that they can have all of the amenities and the infrastructure that have been disinvested in for so long. Beefing all of that up, making, that in, making those investments, and pushing people out so that you know, we're having people who are traveling more. We're not investing in our transportation systems to make sure that they're going to be fossil fuel free because we know that we're pushing people who do have limited means outside of the city and they can just suffer. And so a lot of this comes back to racial capitalism and how this all kind of like plays into this. But, all, but of course, you know, if, as you're doing that, as you're pushing people further and further out of urban cores, there's more development that that's happening. You're consuming more land. And as you said earlier, you know, we people are part of the environment. Or as I like to say, people are critters. <coughs> and our cities, towns, and villages are our habitats. And it's all a part of the environment. And so I think it's time for us to stop thinking of them as separate systems, and they're all interconnected. And we need to make sure that we're stewarding them all together and using practices that have long been in place long before the 1950s, before the 1900s even. So I'm going to stop there because I could ramble about this all day. So thanks. Tracy, you started by claiming not to be a historian, but I think you actually perfectly led us into what I think we were hoping to, to discuss next, which is, you know, you raised issues like the generations of bondage and slavery that this continent has witnessed, violent expropriation of native peoples that happened as early as the 15th and 16th centuries. Chronologically, those things, I think, to a lot of environmentalists seem like long ago. Are those even environmental questions at all? Chad talked about how oftentimes we think about the 60s and Rachel Carson or the first Earth Day in 1970, the beginnings of the environmental movement. The term environmental justice doesn't really come around until the 80s. It doesn't become a regulatory phenomenon until the 90s. So I'd love to ask each of you to, to say a little bit about how does thinking on these much longer time horizons about 
moving our discussions of environmentalism not just back into humans and away from trees and water and air, but also far deep into the past and potentially far deep into the future as well, change what we might do, change the questions that we ask about the moment we live in in the present. Why don't we start with Tracy and we'll come back in this direction. Okay, I don't remember this being on our list of like preparatory questions, so you know, I'm gonna kind of think about this a little bit. Um, but the first thing that comes up for me is as you're talking about time horizons, one of the things I find um, most frustrating is that we tend to think of things in terms of producing instantaneous results and within this election cycle. And whenever we're talking about environmental uh, decisions, for example, you know, we think about infrastructure, the infrastructure decisions that we make today are gonna be around if we're lucky and if we do it right for the next 50, 100, 200, 500 years. I mean, I was in Germany living in places that were around before Christ was born. And so as you kind of think about that, that time horizon, we don't have that kind of time horizon, kind of like thinking here in the United States. You know, because, you know, oh, this house is like 40 years old, it's old, let's like renovate it, let's like rip it down, let's like, totally, you, don't, you don't think about that. And so I think, you know, as we think about the time horizon, if we start also shifting our thinking to think about our built environment and the places, you know, that are urbanized as, part of the environment and part of the human habitat and start thinking about stewarding that, you focus a little less on, as we talked about, you know, federal funding uh, formulas. A lot of the way in which, like, I come back to transportation because I've done a lot of work around transportation, research and advocacy. Uh, one of the things around transportation that makes it so difficult for us to move the needle is that the priority has been on investing in the big flashy, short-term projects that are gonna help people get reelected but there are very few pots of dollars that are actually de designated for long-term maintenance. You know, how are you gonna make sure that there is a, not just sustainable, but regenerative cycle of producing resources to make sure that this is gonna be around for the long-term? Living in Germany, you know, we talk about how old our trains are. Oh, this has been around since 19, look, it's rusting through it. it was, I remember being in Germany and getting onto a train that had been in service since 1920, that's over 100 years, and it was pristine. You had to crank the door open, like with a wheel, but it was pristine. It didn't squeak like our Orange Line trains do. I mean, even the new Orange Line trains still squeak. You know, it, they did not squeak like that. You know, and so you can make sure you kind of think about, you know, what, you know, how were we kind of thinking about things? And so I, I talked a lot about this in the transportation world about thinking about life cycle costs. It's not just capital costs. It's not just operating costs. It's really the life cycle. What is it going to take to make sure that we're provisioning the right things? We're putting in place systems to kind of make sure that they're maintained over the long term. And also thinking about if there is a life cycle that we're thinking about how we're going to decommission this and do all of this equitably to make sure we're doing this so that we're not grazing neighborhoods in Boston. Because I think about the highway, because I, I, hey, I bike the Southwest Corridor to work, you know, every time I, you know, go. It's the fastest way because of the transit system, but we're not gonna talk about that right now. Um, but it's the fastest for, way for me to get down to the financial district from JP. But I also think about every time I'm riding that, I'm thinking about all the houses that were grazed in order to make way for that. I was also a part of a, a similar initiative in uh, Seattle, uh, once again, short-term thinking of putting in place a monorail system uh, to um, get people around as a transit system. And then the short-term thinking was all about pushing one line. No one was talking about the entire system and what it was gonna do in the long term or what it could have done in the long term. So the city had used eminent domain to buy all the parcels to actually put the system into place, but it had been 10 years from the initial point of when the whole project was conceived and when they decided to kind of actually start the construction. And the demographics at Seattle had changed so much and no one took the time to explain kind of what might have been possible so that they shut the project down. So by referendum. Here, it was political activism that required that. They just did it by referendum in Seattle. And so as a result, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, well now the city has to put all of these places back on the market because they were not gonna be doing a Southwest Corridor with all of those properties that they had purchased. And so that's kind of like I say, short-term thinking, let's see what we can pass through is, is really our downfall. So we have to really be thinking multi-generationally, century-wise. And I think about, like I say, standing on top of the Acropolis and how it was pristine until cars started spewing lead-based fuels. 
and now all of a sudden you, you travel around Italy and Greece, and all of the real sculptures are actually in museums somewhere because they have to be protected from the environmental pollution that we have actually caused since you know the middle of the century and our reliance on fossil fuels. I'm going to stop again because I can, like I say, I can, can rant for all day, but but I think that you know we need to really be thinking multi generationally. Yeah, no, and I, I could not agree more with everything you were just saying, Tracy, and really appreciate this point about the the short-term thinking, and I think a lot about the institutionalization of short-term thinking as someone who sits in the academy, but also as someone who served in government. And so I'm sensitive to this point because um, I love history, <laughs> um, but I can't seem to be with the, where the historians are. <laughs> so because I teach planners, uh, city planners, I know that in the planning field that there is a preoccupation with uh, the future almost like a speculative fiction, a speculative fictive future. Um, and it is, and we, we, we live with those results. We live with the idea that planners are constantly thinking of this future time uh, that none of us are ever in. Like we're not there. It's for some other group of people at some other point in time where everything is supposedly better. And so those, that's sort of the foundational principles, those are foundational principles that really are driving planning as a discipline um, to its peril. And so I think the problem or the, the challenge that I always have is trying to get planners to complicate their notion of, of time to understand that time is not lived um, as this sort of abstract thing. We all live time um, through our own life cycles, right? Through a generation of time, whether it's 70 years or 80 years, or people's lived experiences and their memories are the things for us to be thinking about as we consider what time can be. Um, and it, even though I think about historians sometimes with, aff with affection, the problem with historians is historians often think of time as something that moves over time, change over time, and we don't live time that way, right? We live time as sort of memories, things that happened yesterday, things that might happen in the future. You're constantly sort of pulling up these different experiences that you have, and the question is, how can we have a more complicated notion of what time is? How can we allow um, history in very specific ways to inform our decisions and also as I mentioned, having been in government, it's absolutely right that time cannot be experienced through an electoral cycle of two years or four years. It's meaningless in terms of how we live. Um, and I think this has played out for us as we think about, um, at least from a planning perspective, the classic tale of what not to do we know is the story of the West End. And so in 1958, 59, 2000, and then 10,000 people are cleared out of this, this neighborhood down by Mass General. Mass General Brigham, I guess I'm supposed to say now, this entire community is decimated. And in planning schools around the world, since I've been in some of them, um, this is the story that's taught of what not to do. Um, what's amazing about the West End story, and those of us that know it know that the destruction for sure, but what's amazing is the memory of that destruction and the way that it lingers and sits in our city like a presence. And I know it was at the time, I believe it was 2015, Ted, you would know this better than me, Brian Gold and then the director of the BRA or the Boston Planning and Development Agency made a formal apology on behalf of the city of Boston to people who lost their homes um, and lost their neighborhood in the West End clearance. And to know that there were still people, for sure, that were around and could hear and receive that apology, some people would say too little too late. But the fact that the government itself recognized that it had overstepped, though clearing the West End was legal, Though, but was it right is the question. And though people were still clamoring for redress there. And so for me, there was an incredible lesson about the way that time is lived and understood and embodied in residents who live in a city, who live in a place and know, um, know how to make a critique know how to have a, a statement, not know, know how to have, I would say, even a testimony to what's working or not working, not based on some 
bizarre abstraction of the future, not based on some limited electoral cycle, but their own experience. And in this city, if, if nothing more than the West End story and so many other stories like that, I can call out the, the, the New York streets, I can call out some stories around the South End and other places, that it behooves us to really have a much more comprehensive um, and unflinching look at the past in a much more elastic sense of how the past is never past, right? It's always here. And so I think that's something I bring with me into the classroom. But when you talk to people, you don't need to be a researcher. You don't need to have a PhD or be an academic to know that time is much more demanding uh, and much more instructive than we'd like to give it credit for, especially in this country. Uh, but I really appreciate the question and, um, yeah, want to hear more on it. Uh, I think that what Tracy and Carolyn just said can, would be nice segues to take us into Q&A and any comments you have. So I'm going to be very quick and not um, do anything like the comments I had, had thought I was going to do. But I just want to say a couple of things, um, and then we'll sort of uh, give, give it over to um, you all and see how we can get a conversation going. Um, I, I think one of the values of history that I've encountered as an historian um, is to, to confront people who are forgetting. Um, I think if you see people forgetting things, you should be very suspicious because they usually have a reason to forget things. It's usually not accidental. And so like the book I just finished, Whiteness in Plain View, which does a history of racial exclusion in Minnesota, white people have you know, overwhelmingly forgotten that they were involved for two centuries in excluding people of color from their neighborhoods, towns, and cities. And that's not an accident. They do that on purpose to absolve themselves of uh, responsibility for doing something about it. And also, simply to claim that that's just not what happened, right? And they can sort of move through their lives as if this was all just an accident or it happened some other way other than their own doing or other generations before them. There's also another version of this in environmental history. And this involves uh, the role that workers played in environmental activism. So the 1962 date that, that we get with Silent Spring is a problem not only because the book didn't start the environmental movement, but because it it clears away what actually was going on for many decades before um, in terms of environmental activism that often had workers at the very center. Workers were the pioneers of environmental consciousness and protest because they're the ones who are experiencing the most effects of industrialization and urbanization. Um, and it's not the suburbs that launches us into the environmental movement. It's, it's industry and it's cities that get us there. And workers are feeling the things that, that are happening in those places, right? And sometimes this also involves um, people layering, you know, in terms of their class exploitation, their experience with racial discrimination, racial prejudice. Um, so you have sometimes very counterintuitive things happening, like the United Auto Workers is probably the most important union in the 20th century in terms of environmental activism. And you wouldn't think that, right? If I had asked you what's the most important union, it wouldn't have been the United Auto Workers. Another one is United Mine Workers. Again, probably not going to be your first thought um, as far as who was the pioneer. And there, there are reasons for that. I'm not going to go into it. It's something that I do more in the book. But this this is all done, we've forgotten this, or people have forgotten this, because it's supposed, because we need, we need that, that, a memory of that erased in order for people to believe in the idea that you have to choose between jobs and the environment. And you don't, because for, for a century, workers weren't. They were doing both. Um, and corporations brought up this idea. Corporations put forward this idea and try to make us think that it's always been this way, that you've always had to choose. But the other thing that it does is it puts some responsibility on environmentalists, at least environmentalists who haven't been environmental justice activists. They think that they can just go out and work on so-called environmental issues, but actually they have to work on everything else too. They have to create the context for people to do environmental activism. So they need to be pressuring Congress to pass laws to make it easier for people to organize unions. They need to be out there on the picket line with the Amazon workers. Uh, they need to be um, helping you know, in movements that they don't think are related to environmental activism because everything is related, right? And only then are we going to really be able to have a vibrant and robust environmental um, movement that's, that's going to be able to solve the problems of the 21st century, including the ones that we've talked about. But let me end that there, and that leaves us with some time still to do Q&A and comments. Great. Before we launch into Q&A, I just want to let's give a round of applause to this brilliant conversation. <laughs> I'm sure many of you feel the way I do and that I could just sit and listen to this for three or four more hours if we had time. But I'm also sure that there's lots of questions out there in the audience.
Uh, we unfortunately do only have three wireless mics, so this is a relatively small room. I'm going to ask that if you have a question, raise your hand. We'll call on you. and Stand up. T say it loudly. I'll repeat it back uh, if, if we're having trouble hearing it. So the field is open. Yes, in the red shirt. Hi. So um, I wanted to get a kind of better understanding because unfortunately history keeps repeating itself. And so I, um, I live in Dorchester. And so there are definitely areas where we run into a lot of issues where, um, as you were speaking, you know, there's a lot of issues with the transit system itself. There's obviously gentrification happening. Housing is, a, you know, housing that's affordable is an issue. And then obviously the whole link of the heat islands that we live in. So there's this whole intersectionalness that, you know, needs to come together. But there's a lot of silos with environmental groups, housing groups, EJ groups. Um, you know, just everything is so separated because everyone's focused on one specific thing to make things better. But the whole thing is, it doesn't get anywhere. And like right now in Dorchester, we are fighting and have been fighting things like Glover's Corner. Dorchester Bay City is now a conglomerate that is going to be this huge mecca of another seaport that we do not want. And unfortunately, how do we go up against the BPDA? How do we go up against some of these developers? And the whole thing is, with all of this being an issue where the asthma rates in Dorchester and in Roxbury and Mattapan are higher than almost anywhere else in the state, how do we prevent and stop the usual vicious cycle of the same problems over and over again, where people are getting kicked out, they don't have you know, the means or resources, and it, it just, it's one thing after another. And, and I'll just stop there. <laughs> Uh, this is a great kind of uh, just it's been a theme today of talking about the fact that exactly what you're saying people are fighting individual issues a part of that has been from you know people's limited attention but also it comes from our society's tendency to want to break things down to into their component parts categorize them and work on one issue at a time and so anytime I hear a conversation about trade-offs or prioritization I'm like no you have to change your thinking to start thinking about complex systems. Because all of these things are happening at once, and when we think about the temporal factor of like the time scale, they're all happening right now. So my recommendation would be to actually get all of those disparate groups together in the room and start comparing notes. Because it helps when people can focus on going really deep in one particular area, but it doesn't help if they're going deep in one particular area and aren't aware of how what they're doing in this area is going to affect all of these other areas. And so thinking about those complex systems, thinking about you know, what's being fed into those systems, what's cut resulting out of those systems, you know, what happens whenever you start kind of making certain changes here and there. You know, we can't talk about the housing crisis without talking about the environmental crisis. We can't talk about the environmental crisis without talking about the jobs and financial security crisis. We can't talk about, I mean, so all of that is all interconnected and we have to work on it all at once and we have to be comfortable with that. We can't bring people together and start tackling these things as complex systems until we get our systems, our policies, our leaders, our decision makers, people on the ground, actually thinking like that. And that also includes people who are in our communities. Because I still see, I'm working with a lot of different communities in, in the six New England states. And there are areas where the, the community groups, the environmental justice groups on the ground are fighting amongst themselves because of exactly that issue. So we don't have time to think about the environment right now because we're working right now on making sure that people have food to eat. Yes, the reason why people don't have food to eat is because our entire food system and food supply is jacked up because of industrialized food systems and also the damage that we're doing to the environment and the ways in which we're actually producing food. And the global pandemic has made it so that now we have a shortage of workers who aren't able to produce the food, to get the food into the stores. And so when food becomes available, it's going to the wealthier neighborhoods where more dollars can be actually obtained for those uh, uh, food products. You know, all of that is in interconnected. And so we need to be talking about things in that way and then using a distributed leadership model for people to lead on different issues to conquer them all together.
So I would really recommend getting in touch, in touch with your at-large counselors, particularly Rusi Lujin as well, and counselors who are more aligned with the shared prosperity agenda, and work it that way. And that's also a way to bring all those, as Tracy has suggested, all those coalition members together to know that there's an ally and a conversation to move forward. So it's, it's, it's much easier once you've checked the boxes, as you've done, because you've already initiated conversation and there's not any traction there, so you move through. But I'm happy to talk to you about it offline in terms of strategy, too. So I'm uh, Marie Ivanova. I'm uh, the director of the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs at, uh, at Northeastern. And I would love for you, building up on, on this, this question and this discussion, and by the way, I'm also a resident of Dorchester. Can yes. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about the role of academia in these issues and the town down relationships? Karen having you having been in New Haven, uh, that was a very long lasting strained relationship between New Haven and Yale University. Boston is the city in the world with the highest concentration of higher education institutions. What is the town gown relationship when we have Boston, when we have Jamaica Plain, we have Cambridge, and when you know MIT says our our thinking is uh, campus, city, globe, MIT, Cambridge, globe. Then where's Boston in this? We're part of the greater Boston. But when we have a community, I'm, I'm part of this, of this neighborhood, I'm part of this city, and we have a separate governance system, what does that do for this interconnectedness that Tracy talked talk about? And how do we engage academia? And as you see here, we have students, professors, and, uh, and activists uh, ready to, to support. I have a quick two cents, but then I know you have something to say, Chad, and I know you do too, Tracy. But um, I'll talk about it as um, just that super extractive relationship that universities here have with our neighborhoods is the problem a big part of it. And so I think the challenge is to figure out how is it that universities are in service not just to their students and their faculty and getting publications and getting tenure and all that, but how are they helping neighborhood level issues for, for residents? And growing up um, here and growing up in Dorchester, I did experience that sort of that, that, that suspicion that you have in the neighborhood because your neighborhood has been studied to death, has been mapped, has been quoted, but there's no benefit to you in the neighborhood. And because we have so many universities and so many, no offense, students who have term papers, who have independent studies, it's like, you know, and I, I have these students too, we unleash them to 700,000 residents as a field site. And that, that is not it. And so not only is it extracted, but it's, it's not helpful, there are tools that university researchers and even students have that can be of help to residents in their organizing agendas or their activist platforms or just dealing with the knowledge gap. And so that's real. And so for me, I appreciate the question so much because it is a problem. And it makes uh, folks here super suspicious of all of these institutions. And it has a devastating uh, effect on even how young people, um, like I was at one point, <laughs> young people think about themselves in their future. The idea that you would want to be in a university um, is just not cool because universities have been cast and have cast themselves as adversaries, as colonizers and extractive agents um, in too many of our communities. So that's my soapbox, but I'll let the pros kind of speak to it. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't do that kind of research, so um, I don't have as much of a direct experience with that, but I know that's a problem. I, I did live in Lawrence for some time, and I mean, I know that was happening in Lawrence, or it happens in places like Lawrence, where people drop in, do research, go out. Benefits don't necessarily return. But I would also say that there's, there's another way of looking at this. I mean, the reason why we're having debates right now in this country over what history is taught in schools is because it matters what students are learning and the teachers and professors like have a role to play, especially historians, in terms of telling a story that is the story we work with in terms of everything else, right? And th there are, you know, state legislatures that are banning what you can say in a classroom. And that tells you something about what that means, what the significance of that might be. And I think we should keep that in mind and also realize that there are ways that we 
we can, as as people in education, affect change through the work that we do, whatever wherever we're at in terms of the level of the education system. I, I just want to add that two two com two points. Is first of all, is like for those of us who are designing courses and delivering them, and thinking about you know uh, educating students to redesign your curricula so that you don't do what Chad was talking about earlier, about forgetting history. It's, it's very interesting, I think, that you know, as we think about cities, you know, I, mean, I consider myself an urbanist, oftentimes we talk about c cities in terms of the infrastructure and the systems and the technology, but we don't talk about the people, the power, the politics and participation. And so that should be a part of every university course, that any time you're talking about any of the science, any of the um, history, any of the urbanism, you know, any of these topics, there is some role to be talking about the role of people in this and the role that power politics and participation plays in that. Which then when it comes to research, it should really be focused on, on co-creating research to shift academic mindset, to shift the student mindset of this is not your research project, especially if it involves people in place. This is a research project that should be co-created and co-designed in partnership with community. And if it turns out to not be what you originally wanted, you need to be okay with that. And I think, you know, I talked about our healthy neighborhood study and that that whole research study is not just us engaging the community in extracting data. We're asking the community, what is it that you need on the ground as a part of a participatory action research project with action being at the center of it? Because all of the entire research process from design, data collection, analysis and dissemination is all about helping the community take action to address issues that they are experiencing every day. So working with the community to co-create any type of projects, that is should be part and parcel of the way in which all research of the future gets designed. And I know also, Reverend Walker, you're here in the audience, and I know that you've worked with the team at Tufts on various research projects with CREW. And so I, the, I'm understanding that there's also been a co-creation process there. So there are a lot of researchers who are out there thinking about what does public scholarship, what does uh, community-engaged research look like, and we should always start there unless we need to actually do controlled trials on things like coronavirus vaccines. So, but there also needs to be community engaged research around actually deploying those vaccines and, and equitable provision of those. So I'll stop there. Great, well, we've hit the top of the hour. I know some of our panelists can stick around uh, to mingle. The Central Library is open until 8 p.m. tonight, so we're not gonna kick you all out right away. Most importantly of all, though, I want to thank the MAP Center staff. I want to thank the facilities and program staff here at the BPL who keep the lights on and keep this building running, our partners at GBH and at CREW, and finally, our three amazing presenters here with us today. Thanks for coming, and we really appreciate having you all with us.